Galatians 3, 1 through 25. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel before him to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things, written the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. I know that's a lot of, uh, of a passage there. Um, honestly, it has to go together. It's part of a letter that um, Paul wrote to a group of churches in uh, the then known world um, that was called Galatia. And uh, he's writing to deal with specific issues within uh, these local churches. Um, and we've been studying it for the last few weeks and will continue for the next few weeks leading up to the Advent season. This, pa this um, passage today is, is almost a whole chapter. It's a lot, but it follows um, part of Paul's flow of thought. So we, we have to kind of take it all together to understand what he's saying. Honestly, this is one of those chapters that you probably skip over or you just kind of read through and keep going uh, to get to something that's more easy to understand or seems more applicable to your life. I mean, what is the deal with Abraham and why is he talking so much about the law and faith and it's kind of confusing. Why would I, I bother kind of wasting time on this when I can get to some of the stuff that I really know what he's talking about. Like, the, the man, I'd love to get to this passage on fruits of the spirit. That sounds like something that would be really applicable to my life, and I want to be gentle and kind and all these kind of things, right? Well, every part of Scripture, that's the reason we preach through and walk through a book of the Bible, is to take every part of it because every part of it is profitable. Some, you just have to do a little more digging. Um, and so we're going to dig a little bit this morning. And so um, patiently, let's walk through together, and um, the hope would be we'd walk away with a greater sense of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Um, and we're going to look at three things this morning. 
we're going to, and it kind of develops Paul's argument here in chapter 3. And it's these three things. History teaches us to live by promise, not performance. The law teaches us to live by promise and not performance. And then we'll ask the question, how do we live by promise and not performance? So that's what we'll walk through today. Um, I will embarrass them, but we've got some special guests. We've got several special guests here this morning. Special guests to me this morning. Um, Henry and Betsy Morris are here. Um, you may not know them. I do because Henry was my campus minister when I was a freshman at Mercer University. And um, I, this may tell you a little bit about me, um, of how long I was in school and what kind of a student I was because we had three, I had three campus ministers. Um, uh, and we either ran them off or I was in school long enough to have three, however you want to interpret that. But Henry was the first, and, and they left um, after my freshman year, and I thought my world was going to end. Because part of what God had used them in my life for was to point me to the gospel. To send me on a journey um, of ex ex exploring scripture to where then God used it to draw me to himself and change my life forever. And sent me on a course even towards ministry. Um, and one conversation that I've shared with you as a church many times that he may or might not remember is he knocked on my, my, um, my dorm room door at Plunkett Hall. And um, he, we had some conversation about this and that and sports and that. And then we turned, the conversation turned towards the gospel. And he described the gospel. He said, look, I think there's probably three different kind of understandings about what Jesus has done for us. He said, you could think of it like, and I've shared this before with you, but you could think about it like Jesus is on a, a motorboat and he comes out into the lake and you're drowning and he throws you a life preserver and, and you grab onto it and he pulls you to safety. And I said, yeah, that sounds pretty good. He said, or you could think about it as you were starting to sink in the lake and Jesus drives up in his motorboat and he actually jumps in and pulls you to safety. And I said, yeah, that sounds probably better even of what the scriptures might teach. And then he said, or you could think about it like you are dead on the bottom of the lake. You can't save yourself. And Jesus dives in, he pulls you up, and he breathes new life to your dead body and resurrects you. And that bothered me because that was inability. That was nothing I could do. And then we set about to study and look at Ephesians 2 and other passages where he says that's exactly what the Bible teaches. The salvation comes when we are totally unable to do anything about it. He breaks into our life when we're not looking for it, when we don't deserve it. And he makes us a child of God. He regenerates our hearts. He breathes new life into us. It's totally by grace, by nothing that we do. And in our total inability, he shows his total ability, his love for us. And he pursues us and he makes us alive he makes us sons and daughters. The Galatians had heard that message from the Apostle Paul. And they had responded. It says in these first couple of verses of chapter 3, it says, It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. What he's saying is it was vivid. It was real to you. It was more than just a, a, an abstract truth. It had affected you. He had been portrayed. You had seen him. Not just knew about him, but you knew him, that he had been crucified for you and he had changed you, brought you back to life. And he says, why, if that was true, have then you abandoned that grace and now you're trying to work for salvation again. You're trying to add all these things to it that you came to know Jesus and the salvation that he brought by grace. With acknowledging your total inability, but now you're trying to live in relation with him. By doing something, by earning it, by putting on these Jewish ceremonial laws and civil laws to, to, to earn your way to keep Jesus' love for you. And he says, that's foolish. You are bewitched. You've been taken in by these false teachers. And then he sets about to prove to them, again, in another way, like just like he did in chapter 2, but now he's using different illustrations in chapter 3, that we are to live by promise, not performance. That salvation is by promise, not performance. That maintaining and walking with God is by promise, not performance. And so he starts by saying, look, let's remember back. Let's look at history. History teaches us to live by promise, not performance. 
And he uses, he calls on this great example from their past that, that they would have pridefully owned in, in the, the pillar of their faith, Abraham. And he points back to Abraham and he says, Abraham. History, our history teaches us to live by promise, not performance. Look at, look at Abraham, he says. First, he's in verses 7 through 9, he says, look at his call. Know then, it says, that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. He he re- makes them remember back to the call of Abraham when Abraham was a, a pagan from a family of pagans, not seeking God. And God came to him and called him, not because he'd done anything, but he set his grace upon him and said, look, the world is steeped in sin. Man cannot save himself. I'm going to focus my efforts on this man and the nation that will come from him. To bring a promised offspring many, many years later that will be the savior of the world. He called Abraham when he was a pagan. He called him when he was childless with a barren wife. And he gave him this promise of offspring and of nations and of a specific person through that nation, through that family that would be the savior of the world. Abraham's call was nothing that he could do. It was his total inability. It was not a performance, anything he had to do. It was because of the promise that he was going to give Abraham that was going to be the salvation. But you also see it in Abraham's covenant. In verses 15 through 18, he he talks about this this, covenant. He says, to give a human example, brothers and sisters, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now, the promises were made to Abraham, to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. The inheritance comes by the law. It no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. What is he talking about? He's talking about the covenant that he made with Abraham. So he calls him out. Sets his love on him. He promises him offspring and a specific seed, a specific offspring that would eventually save the world. And then he covenants with him. He he binds, it's a binding agreement with him. And they they have conditions and blessings and promises along with this. And the way the covenant situation would work then, just like we would sign something, in order for them to, to sign, to ratify the covenant, they would do something that seems kind of odd to us. They would take animals and they would split them in half, and they'd make a pathway. And then both parties of the covenant of the agreement would walk through in between these animals, and it would basically be signifying in very graphic ways, if I don't keep my end of this promise, maybe what happens to these animals happen to me. That's how serious I'm taking this. The issue with Abraham was that when time came for the parties of the covenant to walk between the animal pieces, he was asleep. But God himself walked through the pieces of the animals, so as if to say, Abraham, if I break my promise, then may what happened to these animals happen to me. And if you break this promise, may what happens to these animals not happen to you, but happen to me. I'm taking the responsibility for both sides of the covenant. There's nothing that you can do. You're asleep. But I'm taking the responsibility on this. It's salvation by promise, not by performance. We also see not just Abraham's call and his covenant. You see Abraham's circumcision. Abraham was the first person that God said, look, this is how I'm going to mark out my people by the sign of circumcision. And he said, look, you're the one. And, and I'm going to give you my promise, but I'm going to give it to you before I even circumcise you. Look, this is kind of odd, I get. But Romans chapter 4 talks about it in more detail here. Romans chapter 4, verses 9 through 12 says this. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised? He's asking the same question to the Romans that he's dealing with in Galatians. Can people who haven't been circumcised, who haven't received the ceremonial sign 
of the people of God, can, can, they, can, can they be called Christians too? Is this blessing that the, of the gospel for them? He says, we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he'd been circumcised? In other words, was he, he received the sign and that merited him some sort of salvation? He, was, he believed in Jesus and he had these Jewish customs and so that counted him as righteous. He says, no, it was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him father of all who believe without being circumcised. So the righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but also who walk in the footsteps of faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. He's pointing to this life of trust, of faith, that it's not because of these outward signs, but it's the heart that believes and trusts and walks in the Lord's ways. Abraham, his life screamed to the Galatian Christians that Salvation and life in Christ is not by performance, it's by promise. It was in his call. It was in the covenant God made with him. It was in the, the, the fact that he received the blessing before he was even circumcised. And that claim, Abraham's claim, holds true. It holds true. He says, the, you know, back in Galatians, in chapter, in chapter in verse 16, now the promises were made to Abraham to his offspring, and he says this, verse 17, this is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterwards does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God. So as to make it void. If inheritance comes by the law, it's no longer it comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. He's saying, look, yes, God covenanted with Moses and the people of God and gave him them the laws that we know of in the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus and so forth. But just because God gave them and co- the law and covenanted them with, with, with um, in a, in a, in a, when had a covenant with them, it doesn't mean that it annulled the covenant he made with Abraham. He's saying this one's still valid. If that changes, then God changes. And God doesn't, God doesn't change. He's saying it can't be both and. If, if it's a promise, then it's a promise. Abraham, what he's known for, what we remember him for, is his faith. And his faith was simply trust in a promise. Abraham believed God. Not just believed in God, but he believed God. He left his family and his home nation and went where God told him to. He loved Sarah, even when she was barren, trusting the Lord to provide the offspring that he promised. He let go of his promised son after he had Isaac. And in Genesis 22, placed him on the altar, giving him back to God, saying, I can't control this. It's got to be you. And more than anything else, he learned. He messed up all over the place when you read his story but he learned obedience he learned what it was to live by faith by trust in a promise by saying God I trusted you to save me and if I trusted you to save me and I'm going to trust that your word and how to live my life is trustworthy as well we know Abraham not because of his perfect obedience but because of his faith He struggled to live according to the promise, not performance. Paul goes on, he says, not only history teaches us to live by promise, but the law itself teaches us to live by promise and not performance. There's a lot of confusing things that are, are mentioned here about the law. But it says a couple of things that it can't do and a couple of things it can do. It says in verses 10 through 12 that the law can't bless us. The law can't bless us. Verse 10 says, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it's written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it's evident that no one is justified before before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. The one who does them shall live by them. He's saying, look, 
if you want to live by the law, then go do it. Go live by them and see how that works out for you. It will be to you a curse. It will be to you a curse in two ways. Objectively, it will be a curse because you will try to keep them and you'll say, God, I want to base my salvation on my performance, so judge me by my performance. And by doing so, you won't measure up. You'll heap condemnation on yourself because you will fail in every way. And so by keeping the law, it will not bless you. It will curse you. You will be under a curse. And subjectively, it will curse you. Because in trying to to earn your own salvation, by trying to to live by performance, you will be anxious. You'll be worried. You'll be despairing. You'll be beat down. Subjectively, your life will be cursed. You'll live in that kind of a state. Because the law can't bless you. Secondly, it can't save you. The law can't save you. You see it in a lot of places here, but uh, look at verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. If a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But what he's saying is it can't. It can't save you. Righteousness can't. The only righteousness you can attain by trying to live uh, according to the law is self-righteousness. You'll measure up to whatever your own standard you set are, and you'll look down to others saying you're not as good as I am in this area or that area. But it's not righteousness that will save. It's not Christ's righteousness. It's not the standard that God has for us. So the law can't bless. The law can't save. So what, what is it for? He actually asked that question. Verse 19, why then the law? Why has God given it to us? He says for two reasons. First, it magnifies our problem. It magnifies our problem. There's a lot, of, a lot of different verses here that say that, but verse 19 says it was added because of transgressions. Verse 22, it says the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin. Verses 23 through 25 talk about by, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until faith would be revealed. He says the law didn't create sin, but it magnified our problem of sin. It showed us that we are not just sinners, but we are prisoners to sin. Think of Paul himself. In in Romans chapter 7, he he does this thinking out loud as he writes to the Roman Christians. And he says that every time he tried to do what was right, he would fail and it would condemn him. And for him, it was the, the sin of covetousness that, that undid it all. He felt like he could keep all of these others of the Ten Commandments, but man, he could not overcome covetousness. And so it undid him. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't do it. He realized that he was not just a sinner, but he was a slave to sin. It magnified his problem, and it does the same for us. But it doesn't just magnify our problem. It actually points to the promise. It teaches us to live by promise and not performance. We see it all over the place, but maybe one of the clearest verses is in verse 16. The promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It doesn't say to offspring, it's referring to many, but to one offspring who is Christ. It's pointing to Jesus. Verses 13 and 14 talk about it as well. It says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The law undoes us, and it points to Jesus. The end here, he talks about it being a a tutor, a, a guardian of sorts. Verse 22 and following, it says, The scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so the promise of faith And Jesus might be given to those who believe. Before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. The picture is of a a slave that was put in charge of taking care of the kids. Meaning that the kids were the rightful heirs, but they were under a guardian to to take care of them, to keep them from from doing what was wrong, to, to raise them in the ways that they ought to live. So that at the right time, they could take their place as heirs and live in the ways that were in keeping 
with a family. And that's, just, that's what the law was. It, was. it was to magnify our problem of sin and point us to the promise in Jesus. Maybe a bad illustration, but it made me think of, of Thor's hammer in the Marvel movies. I mean, it's, it's his, his weapon of choice, right? He saves thousands with this great hammer. But there's this scene in one of the movies where he puts the hammer down on the table, and they're at a party, and they're all taking turns trying to lift the hammer, right? And what are they saying? They're saying what? Well, only the one who's worthy can take it up. So they're all trying, and he's laughing at them. Oh, you're not worthy. You're not worthy. Only I'm worthy. And then Captain America tries to take it, and he gets a little bit nervous because he knows, you know, of, of Captain America. He's worried, oh, may, maybe somebody else is worthy besides me. It's this kind of, something that's meant for other purposes is then being a measuring tool for them to measure them against, uh, against one another to answer the question, am I worthy? It's the same story of the sword and the stone of Arthur. Who's worthy to pull the sword from the stone? It's like a comparison thing when that's not even what the sword is made for. It was made as a weapon to protect, to deliver. The law has been given to us, we said last week, for at least these three reasons. To restrain evil, right? To keep things from getting as bad as they could get. To guide us into the way to live of God's best purposes and ways. It's a light to our feet. But that third use of the law is what Paul is pointing to here. And that is to to be our tutor, to show us our need for a Savior. He says, it's given to restrain and to guide, but if you use it to determine your worth, it will very quickly show you that you are not worthy of it. And that is actually a glorious thing because it points you outside of yourself, not to performance, but to the promise of a Savior that can deliver you. And that's where it leads the last thing we might want to try to begin to answer today, and we'll continue in the weeks to follow, but how do we live by the promise and not performance? How do we do this? And it's a matter of three things. First, it's a matter of understanding. We've got to get the message that Paul's trying to convey in Galatians, that this is, this is the gospel, the gospel of grace, the gospel of Christ's righteousness, and record and not our own, the gospel that, that we are totally unable, that he has to do it all, there's no other gospel. That is the gospel. This is what the Bible teaches. And it's easy for me to say that, and you think, yeah, of course it is. But there's so many churches that teach the opposite, that teach there's something you must do, that you have to get your life right, and then Jesus will accept you. And the gospel says the opposite. That God comes to us with a promise because of what Jesus has done when we're not worthy. It's not only our justification that we talked about last week, in the last two weeks, but it's our sanctification. It's not just our status and our standing with God, but it's our life lived in relationship with him until he comes again. So it's a matter of understanding. Secondly, it's a matter of recognition. How do we live by promise and not performance? Well, it's a matter of recognition. We have to recognize on a day-to-day basis, well, what is it today? What system of performance am I looking to today for comfort and for approval and for control? Am I trying to earn all of those things by my financial security? Or am I trying to gain approval and control and comfort by my athletic status? And achievements? Am I trying to earn it by being the perfect husband or wife or father or mother or son or daughter or friend? Am I trying to earn some sort of approval in the world by some my achievements at work or in life? The way we can identify what system of performance we're looking to is to ask the question of what makes you angry? Or what makes you sad? Or what makes you extremely happy, maybe more happy than most people are about that situation? Those high highs and low lows usually show us what we think is going to give us life and has failed us in some way. And it helps us recognize, oh, I'm not just angry 
to be angry. I'm angry because my comfort has been threatened by this person or this situation. Or my approval of others has been threatened because of this person or this situation. Or my control, illusion of control in life has been threatened by this person or this situation. That's why I'm angry, because I'm living out of performance in hopes that these things will bring me comfort or approval or control. And then we repent of that. And the last thing is it's a matter of accounting. And that's really the key verse in this whole passage is verse 6. Maybe verse 6 and verse 13. (laughs) Because he says in verse 6 of chapter 3, Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. In verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us on our behalf instead of us. There's an accounting that is supposed to happen on a day-to-day basis, not just for salvation once and for all, but for ongoing living with the Lord, walking with him. There's an ongoing accounting that has to happen to think Christ, every, every time I fail, every time I don't measure up, Every time I'm not the wife or the husband or the athlete or whatever it is that I, that I want to be, Christ has died for that. He has been regarded as me. He has stood in my place. He has been counted as sin so that I can be regarded as Christ, as righteous. That's the whole idea of this, this, this word counted to him is when God looks at, at us, he no longer sees us steeped in our sin because Christ, that has been counted to the account of Christ and he has stood in our place and he's paid for it. But now he looks at us and he sees Jesus. Not because of anything that we've done, but because it has been credited, his life has been credited to our account. That term redeemed is so beautiful. Because in the scriptures, in the Old Testament scriptures, redemption means at least three things. First, it would mean buying back from slavery. Someone who had sold themselves into slavery to pay off debts or had been taken over by a foreign army or whatever it might be could be redeemed, could be bought back from that slavery with the cost of another speaks to the worth of a person. I'm willing to pay this price to buy you out of that because I love you that much. It also would mean to provide for an inheritance. There was a kinsman redeemer that could come if if a husband had died, if there was no firstborn in the family, could come and marry the, 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 the widow and take care of them, take them into their family to provide an inheritance Love, community, and it speaks to our need for comfort and for security that's provided in Jesus. He is our redeemer. And then it also speaks of revenge, of vengeance. Because a redeemer, if someone was unjustly killed, a redeemer could go and and act vengeance upon that person on the behalf of those who'd been wronged. And that's big. Because there's so many things that happen in our lives that we are sinned against, that we feel is unjust, that we want to make right. And God's saying, look, I'm going to do that for you. Every wrong will be righted. Trust me for that. Don't take it into your own hands. He is our redeemer. In every way that we can't or failed to keep the law, he has kept it. And there has been a great swap. How do we live by promise and not performance? Well, first understand the gospel, then recognize our system of performances that we're trying to live by, and then do this job of counting his life and mine, giving up, repenting of trying to earn our own salvation by performance and living instead by the promise. Years ago, a movie came out called Saving Private Ryan, and um, it was a a well-done movie, it won all sorts of awards, but um, it, left, it left you very unsatisfied in the end. 
Because at the beginning of the movie, you realize, okay, the whole movie is about this son who had multiple brothers who'd all been killed in the war. And some high-ranking general said no mother should have to lose all of their sons. So he sent uh, a group of, of soldiers to, to go into the war to find this one living son and to bring him back safe to his mom. Great premise of a movie, right? And so it shows their journey. But in the end, multiple soldiers had lost their lives in order to save this one. And in the end, the actual leader, the, the, uh, of the, the lieutenant of the whole company that was going to seek him, is dying. And he grabs the soldier that he's been sent to save. And all he can muster out of his, his, his dying breath is, earn this. All that everybody's done for you, to save you, to present you home safe, earn this. And then in the, the last scene of the movie, you see an old man who's lived his whole life from that point to now, standing over the grave of this lieutenant in tears in his eyes, weighted down by the burden of that statement, saying, I hope I earned it. That is a cursed life. To live under that kind of pressure all of your life. What the gospel is not saying to you and I is, look what Jesus has done for you, you sinner. Now go earn this for the rest of your life. Pay it back. He's done so much for you, go earn it. That is a cursed life. It's performance. It will crush you. What he is saying is it's not performance. It is a promise that he made long before you ever entered the scene that you are swept up in. It's actually got very little to do with you. As Scotty Smith says, you matter, but you're not the point. <laughs> Jesus is the point. God is the point. He's the center stage. He's the hero. You can't earn it, even if you wanted to. That's the point. He's earned it for you, and he's given you the promise and blessing. What is true and what he is saying to you is believe it, trust it, receive it, enjoy it. Not just for salvation, but for day-to-day -day life. Let's pray. God, help us do that. We want to live a life of blessing, not one that is, is cursed and is weighted down by the burden of something that we can't do anyway. So help us. Help us to recognize patterns in our own life of performance that we're trying to run to to receive some sort of salvation, some sort of comfort, some sort of approval. Instead, help us, because of Jesus, to hear loud and clear that you are well pleased with us. And that would bring freedom and joy in obeying you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We always